Elohim, Adonai, El Shaddai, Jehovah. The base names of God that we began to study a few weeks ago is we began to allow God to reintroduce himself to us. We took off on the name Jehovah and we began looking at the names that that went with Jehovah and we learned that, that the Lord desires to be our shepherd. The Lord desires to provide for us. These are the names that he gave himself. And today we're going to look at a, a third name that plays off of the name Jehovah, and that is Jehovah Rapha. So your turn, Jehovah Rapha. Rapha. So what did you just say? The Lord who heals. Oh, man. We hear that name, and let's be quite honest, the Lord who heals, that one, that one excites us. Man, we hear healing and we begin to think about all the things that are wrong with my life. I mean, who among us could not need a little bit of healing? After all, did you know that prayer list that we publish every single month? 75% of that list is pure requests for physical healing. Jehovah Rapha? Well, the aches and pains of our world and our illnesses, well, they give us a lot of stress. And so because of that stress, we desire to be healed. Now, I have to warn you that when we begin to study this name, Jehovah Rapha, I'm going to disappoint you. Because Jehovah Rapha is not about physical healing. That is not the situation where we meet this aspect of God. When God introduces himself of Jehovah Rapha, it is something much more. It is something much deeper than just heal me of my physical problem. Now, before we dive into this, I, I do not want to discount God's ability to heal. I... I can attest to you, God heals. But for this particular name, God's got something important that he wants us to learn. And for us to understand the Lord who heals, we have to take another walk back down our hall. These pictures that I hung up over here on the left when we were doing the Hall of Faith study right at the beginning of the series, I hung these pictures up. I told you I'd be back to them. And well, here we are. We're back to them. And we're going to that very familiar story where we're going to start. We are going to start on the spiritual high of Israel. The story is found in Exodus chapter 14, verses 21 through 31. And we know the story. It's the story of the Red Sea. Dustin Hoffman did it so well. The Israelites are trapped. On both sides of them, there are mountains. There is nowhere they are going. In front of them, there's a sea. There's water. Behind them are their enemies closing in. And God and Hollywood, when they read this, does this very dramatically. Moses reaches up his staff and the water begins to part. And the Israelites cross over on dry land. They have escaped, but then God does them one better. He lets the Egyptians come on into the sea and then he closes all on top of them. And so not only did he rescue them, he eliminated their enemy. That is, the Lord provides. And you would think after that, Israel would have an endearing love for God that would never, ever, ever fade. And that is true for one chapter of the Bible. All you have to do is turn the page, one page, to Exodus chapter 15. And guess what? This is the story that we read. Now remember, we're only one chapter removed from the Red Sea experience. Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went into the desert of Shur for three days. Man, there's that three days again. They traveled in the desert without 
finding water. Now, I got to tell you, I was outside all day yesterday in the heat, and I was over there with the grill cooking, and I got to tell you, I drank six bottles of water. And they were in the cooler, and they were ice cold. See, this is where the preacher did what he was doing. While everybody else volunteered for games over here, the preacher took the spot next to the cooler. So I had six bottles of water plus a few sodas because I was hot and I got thirsty. So here they are. They've been traveling for three days in the heat. No water. When they came to Mara, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. This is why the place is called Mara. So here they are, they're traveling through the desert, and they're thirsty, and their tongues are wagging, and they're dehydrated, and they walk into Mara, and they look out, and there it is, a nice big pool of water. But they couldn't drink it. And since they couldn't drink it, they did the very Christian thing. So the people grumbled against Moses, saying, what are we to drink? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood, and he threw it into the water, and the water became fit to drink. There the Lord issued a ruling and instructions for them and put them to the test. He said, If you listen carefully to the Lord your God, and you do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep his decrees, I will bring you to I will I will not bring on you any diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Jehovah Rapha. He says, I'm going to heal you. And it's interesting when you begin to look at this as the Lord who heals, because God took them from the point at which they had a Red Sea problem. I've got too much water in my way to a desert problem where I ain't got no water. And yes, I realize that's not good grammar, but it works much better. I ain't got no water. And suddenly, the God that rescued them seemed to be gone. And now they were on their own. And I can't fault them. I can't. But they began to complain that they were thirsty. And again, I got a feeling after three days in the desert with no water, I might have been leading a chorus of complaints myself. And then they come in tomorrow. There's their water. The water is not drinkable. And it called it bitter. And so I want to ask you a question. Have you ever been bitter toward God? Have you ever had one of those moments when things are going on in your life and you just don't understand why? In the video clip I, I showed you right before we started the sermon, we witnessed two people sitting there on a, in a cemetery and both of them had a problem with bitterness for different reasons. The man was bitter because God almost took his son from him. That one I can relate to. That one I can understand how going through that kind of trial and tribulation can make you question what God is doing, what God is thinking, why God would do that. I'm very thankful that I've never experienced what the lady was struggling with. The lady was bitter because God took her son. Because her son was gone. And she said it very well. I'm not mad at the church. I'm not mad at the preacher. I'm not mad at the fact that your son is still alive. I am mad at God because God did something to me that just made me bitter. And life can do it. Life can leave you bitter. And you don't have to lose someone to experience it. Life can leave you bitter when your family falls apart. Life can leave you bitter when, you're, when your money goes away because of the, the things that happened through the recession. Life can leave you bitter when your plan that you had in place did not work out. Life can leave you bitter. We get angry and we get upset. Oftentimes... 
I got more questions than I got answers. I just want some understanding, God. Why are you doing this? Why are you walking me through the desert with no water when you said just a few chapters before, I am Jehovah Jireh, I am the Lord who provides, and now there is nothing for me. And so we take the common approach to the difficulties and the stressful way of our lives, the same way the Israelites did to their stress. We simply complain about it. So the people grumbled against Moses. Now it's kind of interesting. Whenever you got a complaint, none of us usually are big enough to start off grumbling to God. Most of us don't usually start out with making God the target because God is God and I'm not, and so I'm not allowed to do that. And the Israelites followed the same pattern. Who did they pick? It's the leader. The guy that had come over there and just freed them from slavery. The guy that showed them God's power by the plagues that were put on Egypt. The guy that they had just watched stand on the rock with his staff and do this and watch. Them. That guy, they said, this is your fault. It's your fault that I'm thirsty. It's your fault that I've got these problems. I am going to go after the leader. And that's normal. I understand that. And they may ask a very valid question. What are you we to drink? Hey, Moses, when you were packing up the camels, did you happen to remember the bottles of water? Hey, Moses, did you have a plan? Didn't you get a map that said where the water... What are you doing, Moses? Are you really fit to lead us if you can't even solve the little bitty problem of water? Something that every single person has to have. But you know what happens? As we continue to complain about the leaders and the problem doesn't go away and God continues to bring the stress up, eventually we take the approach of Job's wife in Job chapter 2, verse 9. This is what the wonderful advice that she gave to Job. His wife said to him, Are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. Don't we get to that point? If God doesn't eventually bring us some relief to our stress, if God doesn't eventually do something for our life, if God doesn't come in and fix my problem, eventually I turn on God. Now again, I told you, I, I've been to this point. I have been to the bitter waters of Morrow to where the point that I am questioning, not that God exists, I am questioning, God, do you really love me? God, if you really cared anything about me, this would not be happening in my life. God, it's your fault because you promised. And don't tell me everybody doesn't get there at some point. Everybody has these moments when we want to just have this, this anger toward God. And here's the good news. God's a really big God. And while he does not want us to be irreverent, I have kids, just so you know, if you didn't know that already. I have two of them. And my kids don't always understand why I do what I do. And when I do what I do, sometimes, believe it or not, I know you, you find this hard to believe, they get angry with me. And they get upset at me. And believe it or not, you, you, this is going to be a surprise. Sometimes we argue. It happens in our house. And it's not that there's anything wrong with it. They are questioning things, and, and, and they want to know why. And sometimes my best answer is this, because I said so. That's my answer to them, because I said so. That's why we're doing it. I'm not going to explain it to you right now. Well, God's kind of the same way. He's not going to explain everything to you. But here's what I want you to know. When the time is right, when God is ready, God can heal a bitter heart. This is what verse 25 says. Then Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water, and the water became fit to drink. Interesting enough, when God's going to heal this bitter heart, it begins with us crying out for help. That's where Moses had to go. Moses had to go from the point of the people are coming here and complaining to God 
And Moses' relationship was strong enough with God that God took the problem straight. I mean, Moses took the the problem straight to God. He said, God, you're the one that sent me to Egypt. Remember, I was very happy out in the wilderness with my sheep. All was good. I had my family. And you're the one that lit the bush on fire. You're the one that told me to go to Egypt. You're the one that said to tell these people I am that I am. You're the one that said bring these plagues down. God, you led me out here. So God, fix the problem, Lord. Sometimes you have to get to that point. When you're willing to face God, mano y mano, one-on-one, and cry out for his help. But here's what you need to know. The solution to the problem of bitter water was not from the mind of man. It was rather from the Lord himself. God did not like send the magic pool cleaner to fix the water. God did not give Moses a plan that really, honestly, made any sense at all. I mean, you think about what Moses is doing. He's got, Israel's about probably a tribe of about a million people. I don't think I'd ever want to be the leader of a million people. But a million people are upset at you all at the same time. And you go to God. And well, God says, you see that tree? Moses like, yeah, I see that tree. I'd like you to put it in the water. And I'm sure Moses is looking at God and saying, God, I got a big problem and you want to make a boat. I don't need a boat. We need the boat at the Red Sea. I need something different. But you have to realize for this plan to work, for God to heal your bitter heart, Moses had to actually put the tree into practice. Moses actually had to pick up what God had said do and throw it into the water, trusting that whatever God had in plan for it, that was going to fix the problem. Now, I want you to wrap your brain around this for a second. When you think of the many bitter situations and experiences of life, what tree makes a difference? The cross of Christ. You see, once again, God is showing an object lesson here that Moses was required to pick up this piece of wood, this this trunk of a tree, and throw it into the pool. And you realize that is what God asks us to do a lot of times. Take the cross. And when I look at the cross, I don't think of problems being fixed. If you study history, the cross was a torture device. And God says, I want you to take that and throw it in your life. And guess what? Problems of life can become sweet. Those struggles that you're dealing with, they can be sweet. It's like that Mary Poppins song, the spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down. Wasn't even tempted to play a Mary Poppins song to start a sermon, just so you know that. Reach my limit with Lucy. I don't think I can do Mary Poppins. But this is what God said in Exodus chapter 15, verse 26. He said, if you listen carefully to the Lord your God and you do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep his decrees, I will bring you on to, I will, I will not bring on you any diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Now, before we go through this verse, I want to make sure when he says, I'm not going to bring any diseases on, he's not telling Israel you'll never get sick. He's saying, I'm never going to rain down plagues on you like I had to do with Egypt to get them to pay attention to me. So he's not promising health there. He's promising the lack of judgment. But I want to walk through this verse 25 because sometimes I don't get, don't we get what God wants out of us if we want the bitterness to leave from our life. See, if you want that bitter to become sweet, the first thing you have to do is listen. Didn't you pay attention to the song that we were singing in rounds? I will listen. Sometimes that is the first step is you have to be willing to listen to God. And then after you listen, you have to be willing to follow. God may give you some specific things that he asks you to do. He may give you some instructions from his word. He may send somebody in his life with some guidance for your life. And God says, I want you to listen to them. And then what they say, do, that's what I want you to do. Because what I really want you to do, that just don't know. There you go. I want you to pay attention. You used to have this really cool shirt when I was a 
a younger kid, and well, I wasn't a kid, I was an adult, and I used to wear it to work every now and then. It says, I'm so broke, I can only pay attention. Well, th sometimes that's what God wants us to be. He wants our life to be so broken that the only thing left that we can do is pay attention to what he has for us. That's it. He didn't ask the Israelites to take up an offering. He didn't ask them to make a sacrifice. He just says, listen, follow, and pay attention. And life can be made sweet. Man, don't you want that? Now, I want you to get this. This is not a promise that nothing bad will ever happen. As a matter of fact, this is kind of a guarantee that something bad is going to happen. Because if nothing bad ever happens, then how can you ever tell the difference from the bitter and the sweet? Sometimes you have to experience the bitter to understand the sweet from God. It's just a promise that, well, God himself is not going to work against you. He's going to be right there. And then he makes the all-important promise. I think I'm going. See if I can go back. There you go. He makes the all-important promise that I will heal you on the inside. I'll take away the bitter. Now, in this case, he fixed the water. But it doesn't always mean that God's going to fix the situation just like you want. If you've lost someone, I'm going to probably go on a limb here and say he's not going to raise them from the dead for you now. It's going to take time for the bitterness to heal sometimes. But he promises, I'll heal you on the inside. I can help you with that. Because I am the Lord your healer. Literally, that word means Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who will make bitter things sweet. If you go back and research the word, that is what he's saying. I will make bitter things sweet. It's like got sugar packages. I'll make it where you can deal with it. He says the name Jehovah Rapha is that what speaks to our, our needs today because while we need physical healing, I got to tell you, a lot of us we're dealing with bitterness. We've got things in our past and things in our life that it just, it hurts us. We live in a stressful world and a society. Every day new problems confront us. We bend under the load. Seemingly unsolvable problems. But Jehovah Rapha, he desires to heal us. He wants our sick world to be healed. But it means that we're going to have to do some things. Because it will only be healed when we allow him to. You know, if Moses had looked at God and said, God, I think we need another plan. That's a cool plan with the tree. It would be a great magic trick. Plan B, please. How about rain? Rain would have fixed the problem, right? God could have blew up a big old thunderstorm and just told Moses, okay, everybody here get a bucket or whatever holds water and go out and set it in the desert and I'm going to dump a rainstorm on them and I will fix the problem that way. You know what the problem is? Rain can be explained. Somebody comes and says, oh yeah, well, lucky for you that storm blew up. But see, God wants you to understand you have a choice. Bitter or sweet. You can live your life in your bitterness. You know, because after Moses threw the tree in the water, you do understand something, right? Somebody had to take a drink. Somebody had to say, I trust God enough to dip my water, my cup in there and take a drink. Because when they were talking about bitter, they weren't just talking about it tasted bad. You understand that the water probably had disease and fungus and algae and I got a feeling it probably was green when they got to it. I don't know if God made it look any better. He just said, I'm going to make it where it's drinkable. But they had to take the step of faith and dip the cup in there and drink from it. That's important. Their choice. So God, you can live in your bitterness if you want. Or you can live in the sweet with God. You can listen to him and you can follow him and you can allow him to impact your life and you can let that be your life. But the choice is yours. You can either get to know Jehovah Rapha or you can't. Your choice. But you need to know that God has a desire 
to heal you. We're going to do a time of decision. This is real simple. Today, if you've never experienced Jehovah Rapha and you've never experienced that first step in giving your life and taking that cross that Christ put in, hung himself on and put in this central part of your life, this time of decision is for you to come forward and we'll show you what it means to be a Christian. This is also a time where maybe you have been living your life in the bitter. Man, life has just drug you down and you are beat up and you've just got things in your life that has sucked all the energy out of you. This time of decision, this psalm we're going to sing, is your chance to release it. And say, you know what, God? I'm just going to listen to you. I'm just going to follow you. I'm going to pay attention to you. And I'm going to trust that you, Jehovah Rapha, are going to lead me where I need to go. Whatever it is you need to do during this time of decision, let me encourage you to do so. Would you please stand? We're going to pray and then we're going to sing.